Our, uh, our, our final panel this afternoon is about gun violence uh, in our justice system and specifically what Chicago might learn from other big cities. New York and Los Angeles have both faced serious gun violence problems, both addressed those problems and seem to have had some success. Can we learn from them? Or is our problem completely different and unique? Regardless, what is it that Chicago should do about the gun violence problem? So our panel this afternoon includes Rosanna Ander. Rosanna is the founding executive director of the University of Chicago Crime Lab. She's also on the International Association of Chiefs of Police Research Advisory Committee. She's served on the public safety transition teams for Mayor Rob Emanuel and Governor Bruce Rauner. And before that, she oversaw the Joyce Foundation's gun violence program. Walter Katz is a native of Chicago, and since last month, he's been the chief of staff for public safety in the Mayor Emanuel administration. Before returning to Chicago, Mr. Katz served as independent police auditor for the city of San Jose, California, and prior to that, deputy inspector general for the county of Los Angeles, overseeing the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. He's also advised many other police agencies and municipalities on use of force and violence issues. Uh, judge Patricia Mendoza is an associate judge in the Circuit Court of Cook County, and for 11 years she's been assigned to the Juvenile Justice Div Division Delinquency Section, presiding over matters involving minors who have been accused of committing crimes. Judge Mendoza has a remarkable first-hand vantage point of violence that plagues our city. Um, John O'Malley is uh, scheduled to be a fourth uh, panelist, and he's not here yet, but we're starting a little bit early, and so if he, if he arrives, he'll, he'll join us. Um, all right, I'm going to approach this, uh, this panel a little bit differently, and I'm going to sort of ask questions generally to all of you, and we can just have a free-flowing conversation. And let me start my first question um, by doing something that I'm very good at, and that is sounding really naive and probably a little bit dumb, okay? Chicago has 2.72 million people, and we had 764 murders in 2016. New York City is 6 million people bigger than Chicago, and they had 434 fewer murders. Los Angeles is a million people bigger than Chicago, and they had 470 fewer murders. What are they doing right, and what are we doing wrong? Simple question, or is that absurdly naive? Anyone? I guess I'll start. Um, thank you for staying. <laughs> so uh, there are no simple answers, and I think you could have had uh, this exact same conversation with the exact same questions and bullet points 15 years ago in Los Angeles, and you would have had the same, you know, furrowed brows and saying, we're not exactly sure why at that point 15 years ago Los Angeles had a significantly high murder rate than a lot of other major cities, uh, but then Los Angeles embarked on a, a series of steps, which was, I think, a combination both of uh, uh, federal prosecution policies, uh, state law changes, uh, which were perceived as rather draconian uh, after a while. But then also, I think Los Angeles then really started developing uh, really smart thinking about intervention strategies. Uh, but from my point of view, the Los Angeles experience was that it could not occur both without uh, the way it approach, approached enforcement and also the way that it's now approaching intervention. And I know Rosanna can talk more about the intervention side. Great, well I will, before I do that, I just, there's been a lot of picking on lawyers uh, today. So I, I'm not a lawyer, I am married to one, but I also wanna give a shout out to a lawyer who's in the room. Um, my uncle Bob is here, which is such an honor to me. He uh, put me through undergraduate and graduate school. So uh, I have a huge debt of gratitude to, to lawyers. Um, so thank you, Uncle Bob. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so I think actually what's, what's heartening about the New York City and Los Angeles experience is 
20, 25 years ago, New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago all had exactly the same homicide rate, or almost exactly the same homicide rate. And so it is, there, you know, is hope that things can change, and I think we ought to be looking at other cities, not just New York and Los Angeles, um, but I also think those cities and other cities look to Chicago as well, and I think cities can learn from each other, and I think there are some things that uh, LA did in particular that I think make it a really good model for us to look at. I mean, number one, they fundamentally transformed their police department. It didn't happen overnight. It took significant investments. I think having the consent decree kind of hanging over them helped. Um, but they, they fundamentally transformed their police department. At the same time, they dramatically decreased homicides and, and violent crime. So it's not an either or. Either you have a police department that's you know, trusted by the community but can't fight crime, or you have a heavy-handed enforcement uh, oriented police department that it doesn't have the community trust. So I, I think there are a set of things that they did strategically over time that I think really helped contribute to their massive uh, crime drop. It also required really significant resources. And I think it's a mistake to think that we are going to, this problem, this challenge that we're facing in Chicago, which, you know, we already had a higher homicide and violent crime rate before, but what happened in 2016 was an historic event and I don't think is going to self-resolve. And I do think it's going to take a very, very serious commitment of resources, resources in uh, new investments in policing and training. I'm glad that that was referenced quite a bit today. The importance of investing in the human capital of the officers that we want to go out into the communities. But also we need to be investing in programs and strategies in the neighborhoods where the violent crime is the greatest. It needs to be a both and. And I think Los Angeles really did that. They spend now tens of millions or more on prevention and intervention programs in a very, very targeted way. And it's not that, uh, all due respect to all the aldermen who uh, may be in the room or people who know the aldermen, um, it's not every uh, neighborhood gets the same level of resources. The resources are allocated based on the need. And so they identified the 15 in Los Angeles communities that had the highest rates of violent crime. And then basically, on the based on the level of violent crime, they distributed the resources and the resources had to go to prevention, intervention, and reentry strategies. And if you had the highest violent crime rates, you were gonna get a larger share of the resources. So I think we need to be really looking at the problem, um, not that everybody should get an equal share, but how do we allocate the limited resources we have most effectively. Great, I want to um, stop right now and introduce John O'Malley who, who has just joined us. And uh, John, you weren't late, we were early, so, so you're perfectly on time. John O'Malley is the uh, Corporate Security Director for William Blair and Company. Previously, he was Chief Deputy uh, United States Marshal for the Northern District of Illinois. Uh, he's also a member of the uh, Chicago Police Board. So John, thank you for being here as well. Absolutely. I, I was um, late, I was stopped by the uh, First District Tag Team on the way here. <laughs> stopped and fritz, so. There, well. That's a joke. I, that, that might be. Oh, all I know is, I don't know if anybody heard it, but during one of our panels, there was an awful lot of siren activity going on outside, and, and I can only imagine what was going on. Um, I'm gonna follow up just on my, my naive question, then we're gonna drill down, and I'll, we'll talk specifically about, I'm gonna talk about California first. But um, when I was looking at the numbers, and I was thinking to myself, my God, Chicago is equally as diverse as New York, in LA, and we're a big city, but not as big as they are. Why is this not a fair comparison? The response that I got was that Chicago is far more segregated than both of those cities, and therein lies a problem. Does that make sense? It, it does, but I think all these things have multiple layers. Uh, you know, for those who don't know, I've been the mayor's deputy chief of staff for public safety for uh, just a tad over a month. Uh, and uh, most of my career is spent in uh, Los Angeles, uh, both working as a public defender and then also moving over to police reform issues. Uh, but there are unique factors in Los Angeles which also have driven down a violent crime rate. And it's interesting you, you mentioned segregation because one thing which has had a real impact in crime in Los Angeles is gentrification. Los Angeles' is geographic makeup is not where uh, impoverished populations are relatively far away from the city center and the south and the west side. It's more of a checkerboard system. So for example, 15, 20 years ago, uh, nobody would have, Echo Park was a predominantly immigrant neighborhood. 
uh, probably more than 75 to 80 percent Latino, many of them first generation. Well, as gentrification has moved from Los Feliz, Silver Lake neighborhoods into Echo Park, those populations have been priced out of the market, and many of them have actually left Los Angeles to outlying areas such as Moreno Valley or the Antelope Valley. So sometimes you see decreases in crime are actually not necessarily because of a crime fight, but you really have to understand the underlying demographics as to what's going on. Okay. Um, Los Angeles, and the striking number here is that in the past 25 years, their homicide rate has dropped by 90 percent, almost 90 percent, 2,500 89 homicides in 1992, only 294 last year. Uh, there's all sorts of articles written about how they pull that off. Um, Rosanna, you mentioned um, a couple of them. Um, I also read that hotspot policing is something that's used quite a bit, and it seems to me that, gosh, maybe that would work here. And I actually think we're doing that here. I mean, I want to give the police department a little bit of credit. Um, they, I mean, I think they are trying to use some of the, what are viewed as some of the best practices, hotspot policing. But I, I think we have to recognize that it can be helpful to reduce crime, but it's not in and of itself sufficient to keep crime down. And you need to be thinking about when you're trying to reduce crime, what are you trying to replace uh, you know, in those areas? How do we ensure that those then become places where the community really feels safe over the longer term to come out and fill it with other things uh, where it might have been an open-air drug market or where there might have been other things going on? So I think um, we need to understand what the limits are of a policing strategy and what else needs to be done as a complement to the policing strategies. Okay, you mentioned um, the, the, uh, the concept of, of consent decrees and the effect that that may have on different on different. Um, communities. Um, consent decrees in California are something that have, have been used, and uh, what, what kind of effect have those had? Walter, do you know? You mentioned this when you were discussing last oh, night. Oh, well, uh, the consent decrees, the effect they had in crime, well, they had an effect in the police department uh, massively. In fact, I think when one looks at the spectrum of federal interventions, uh, the consent decree, which was uh, agreed to in the early 2000s after the Rampart crash uh, scandal, I think many people perceive as that being as one of the more successful consent decrees that has occurred historically. Uh, but it was a massive effort. It cost millions of dollars. It required uh, a commitment uh, of hundreds, literally hundreds of officers to the reform effort and then uh, to push down the reforms from top to bottom. Now, w the correlation between, or causation, between the consent decree reforms and the crime rate, uh, that I think people are still trying to understand. The same reason why people are trying to understand uh, when you look at New York City stop and frisk, where after the stop and the frisk litigation, you had a significant decrease in stops, but also the fall in the homicide rate and the overall crime rate continued to fall in New York. Um, it's an interesting point you make about the stop and frisk in, in, in New York um, because earlier when I was sharing some data regarding the police stops in Chicago being at 60,000 per month uh, in November of 2015 and then dropping to 10,000 per month in January of 16 and continuing that way, um, some, I did not know that there might be almost a direct correlation between the term police stop and the term stop and frisk. But I understand that, that to a certain extent, those are, those are one and the same. Is that correct? A police can stop on somebody without frisking them. But, I, you know, I think that the consent, to, I mean, sorry, the um, street stops data that, is share, that was shared with, by the police department going from 60,000 to 10,000 were stop, question, frisk. The, we don't actually track and I don't know that any department tracks every time a police has a citizen police encounter. So that could be a police stop or interaction that doesn't result in uh, sort of to the point of questioning and then frisking them. Okay. Um, well, okay. So the, the history of the Chicago Police Department, and I can speak directly from personal experience of this, is that any interaction, a police officer, whether uniformed, special unit, whatever, with the citizens is supposed to be documented. There used to be what they called contact cards whole purpose of that program was to make contact with people in certain, anywhere in the city, so that if someone was a, uh, a suspect or a person of interest in a crime, detectives, one of the first measures they would take is to go to 
the area where this particular potential offender may or may not live and look into was there ever contact made and using those contact cards as a conduit to a investigation that a detective either a homicide investigation armed robbery burglary was making to see where that contact was made was an individual who was from the seventh district what was that person doing up north in the 20th district do they have people who were they with when they were contacted by the police that then became into well what is the purpose behind that stop and contact is there a probable cause is there cause under terry v ohio to stop that individual because they match the description of an armed robbery that just took place the day before, two minutes before, whatever. So um, it is interesting to see the correlation of when the litigation and the stop and frisk in New York came out, you didn't see a dramatic increase in crime. Now, I think it's too early to take a look at where Chicago PD went from 60-something thousand stops a month and continues to plummet. It just so looks as that we saw an increase in particularly homicides. But I think it's too early to say, is that connected, is it not? Um, but I find it, you know, the, the comparisons in New York and Los Angeles to Chicago, other than geographical and the amount of people that live in LA, New York, and Chicago, the culture, and I worked both in Los Angeles, the only time I was ever involved in a police officer shooting was in Los Angeles. And I spent a lot of time in New York City, and the attitude of the police departments from LA, Chicago, and New York it might as well be in different countries. Okay, so we have to look at what, there are some great best practices from other cities, but they don't always fit. We can't take that box and shove it into Chicago and expect that it's gonna work. You don't see many 11-year-olds and 12-year-olds in New York City running around shooting people or getting shot. Okay, today is Friday. We've had in the 20 to 30 people shot this week alone. and. You know, if it wasn't for today's weather, that would increase. So I don't know how much, I think we look at, I think LA is already in Chicago, right? They've been implanted in the city to help uh, uh, with, some of our, with, with some of our issues and seeing if we can come up with a program that may work in Inglewood that then can be transferred to Harrison, to the 9th District, to the 8th District, everywhere in the, in the city. It's a very large animal. I, you know, it's, it's gonna be difficult, it's not gonna happen by the end of this summer, for sure. Okay, I, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in what you just said a couple of minutes ago there, and sure. I think we should just put it all out here on the table because yep. it's, we're trying to find Sorry. solutions here. When you're describing New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago, you say they might as well be different countries. Mm -hmm. What is it, from your observations, Mr. O'Malley, that sure. is so different? Um, so the gang structure, to begin with, um, at one time in Chicago was extremely organized. I mean, everyone in this room, if I threw out the name Larry Hoover, would have some reaction to that. Uh, be, we'd be hard pressed to find someone in this room right now that could tell you who a gang leader of the Gangster Disciples, Vice Lords, Latin Kings, who is that number one person as we sit here today. Um, so there's a fraction, with the, the fractured, the, the gang structure was totally fractured. There's, I think the panel before this that I didn't obviously see was about social media. Um, I think there's a cultural, uh, guns are glamorized. Um, every time, for years, I kept data in my own head of why these guys carried guns, what was the culture, what was the reason behind it, and I'm sure it came in some conversation today that the answer you get from most of these guys, I'd rather be caught with a gun than without, okay? And I retired two years ago from law enforcement. I have the same mentality. With what I see going on in this city, I'd rather be I carry my gun probably more now than I did off duty as an active law enforcement officer, which I'm allowed to do, by the way, okay? <laughs> HR 218, in case anyone's <laughs> checking. But I get that mentality. Um, and if I lived in some of the areas that are affected by this plague of violence, I, I don't care if I have a permit or where I got the gun, I'm carrying that gun. And that's the attitude here in this city and younger and younger and younger kids. Um, and you know, judge, as a juvenile judge, I'm sure you can attest to that, but I don't know where, how we stop that. New York and L.A., um, it just doesn't seem to be as prevalent. So in New York and L.A., you don't see the 11 and 12-year-old kids with guns or committing gun offenses, right? Well, we'd have to ask someone who's in embedded in, NY, right. in New York, NYPD and LAPD and LASO, I guess, to really think of that. But 
if, if that were the case, I think we'd be hearing about these juvenile homicides, victims and offenders in those areas. Okay, Rosanna, then yeah. I want to ask Judge Mendoza about that. I was just going to say, 25 years ago, they were. So something changed. Mm -hmm. So, I, And I want to just agree that we should not look at any city as, you know, a perfect fit for what I'm just saying that there are things potentially yeah. from Los Angeles, New York, but also Absolutely. lots of other cities that we can think about trying to adapt for Chicago specific context. But it, I think it is important to remember that 25 years ago, there were 11, 12, 15 year olds carrying guns and, and being shot. And they have figured out through a set of things, certainly some gentrification, I would agree that that is probably part of the LA story, but not the only part of the LA story. But I think there are lots of other cities, Oakland has done, as you know, some amazing things. So I just think we, given the size of our crisis, we need to be open to looking at things from other places. And again, figuring out how to adapt it to the Chicago context. And I think one of the things that I think is important about what both LA and New York have done is really significant investments in their policing. It is a very professional, both departments are very, very professional. They are invested in it in a way that we are not investing in our Chicago officers. And I think we're asking them to go and do one of the hardest jobs without the right tools, without the right training, and without the right support. And we should not be surprised with the outcomes that we're getting. Yeah, I think, you know what, I think that that is a huge key right there is I've been pushing training and I, so I worked with Chicago police officers hand in hand. I come from a family of Chicago police officers and I'd like to use Major League Baseball as an analogy. We have Major League Baseball teams that every spring they all gather together and for weeks if not a month or more practice to become baseball players. Chicago police officers handed his credentials and his gun after basic training and potentially could go do a 30 year career without having any other training. So we expect these officers to go out there uh, with very limited training and that reflects to the community. To me, a better trained, more experienced officer is gonna make better decisions and that will then reflect on the community to a professional law enforcement agencies and the respect will then transfer both ways. Very little right. training and very little support for their health and wellness right. either. I, I, Absolutely. Right. And I'd agree with that. I think when I was at the LA County Office of Independent Review, one of the oversight attorneys, I think we probably did more uh, training along with LASD, going under range, going with the scenarios, doing defensive tactics training, just so we could learn what it was like, than to think the average Chicago police officer goes through uh, on a yearly basis. There is just a minimal of in-service training. When one looks at the investments that the city meaning that the residents are willing to make in policing in Los Angeles, it's a staggering difference. I can safely say that a police officer in LAPD after about four years of service will probably be making about $100,000 per year. The amount of investment into that officer's training from the academy onwards is a staggering amount of money. Uh, but they do it for, because they understand what the long-term investment is. Uh, before we go too far off track from what we were talking about a moment ago, which was, which was children and guns, I want to ask Judge Mendoza for her perspective because she's on the front line of dealing with children coming to court being charged with gun offenses, um, apparently in a way that might be rather unique to our city as opposed to some other big cities. What's your perspective on that, Judge? Yes, um, I am unaware of what's happening in Los Angeles and New York. I can barely keep up with, with what's happening here, but I can say that I got to juvenile court in 2006. And I remember being asked, you know, what's it like? What's the average age of kids that come in? What are the kinds of crimes? And at the time, I remember saying, well, they usually come in about 15 or 16. And, you know, the crimes were like what I thought sort of like the low level of crimes. It was, you know, retail theft. It was maybe a fight. Um, you know, the kinds of things that you kind of thought kids got involved in. Now, uh, you know, my little summation when people say, how's it going now? I say, the kids are getting younger, the crimes are getting more serious, the resources are becoming more scarce. So now it is not uncommon for me to get, it's almost the usual thing to get kids coming in at 13. I have a number of 12 year olds, but 13 is now about the entry age. And they're not coming in with a retail theft or a simple battery, they're coming in with a gun case. They're coming in with a gun case. I have two 13-year-olds who have already been shot and then come in with their gun case. So 
it's a whole new world. They are babies. And I can tell you they're babies because they may be all big and bad and carrying their guns, but when they hear that I'm going to hold them in custody, they cry like the 13-year-old kids that they really are. So it's this you know, dichotomy. I, you know, that's sort of my summation. And I think that one of the other scary things, and someone said earlier in one of the other panels, is that um, a lot of these kids are carrying the gun for safety. I hear that more often than not. The other thing that we're seeing is some of the older kids that are coming in are kids that in the past you would not have seen even going near a gun. They're A students, they're on track to graduate, they have two parent families. These are not the kids that again you would normally have seen coming in with that serious of a case. And they're coming in because they're getting bullied at school, they're getting bullied by the gang, so they're not gang members, but they want to survive, and so they're showing up with guns. We were talking last night, and you uh, made the reference to, to your perception that it's almost a badge of honor for these kids to be either arrested with gun offenses or maybe even convicted of a gun offense? Yeah, it, it, again, I think of my 13-year-olds, and I think of you know frontal lobe development or lack of development, and this one child who's been shot twice, um, the second time, I was told he was in the hospital in critical condition, and he was in electronic monitoring, and um, I said, okay, fine, go get the bracelet. They probably need it off of him so they can deal with him in the hospital. And then through the grapevine, I heard he was back home, and I said, mm, I'm not so sure about this kid. Go to the house, make sure that there's a bracelet on him. I don't trust him not to try to leave the house if he can even crawl out. Well, you know what? He wasn't there when they showed up. He was back out on the street. This 13-year-old has a green, and, and you know, they're all about this tall. They're not kids that are oversized or look older than they, they are. These are the little shorties who I guess are doing it because they've got to like gain respect and gain, gain street cred. And here's this 13-year-old who survived two shootings, has picked up two gun cases, you know, people, and I, I you know, the sheriff share stories with me and they're like, yeah, they get respect upstairs. The kids upstairs are bigger, but you know if their crime is more serious and they've survived a gunshot, they get respect. So they're not going to be picked up in detention. So it's almost like me sending them to detention is me sending them somewhere where they can be glorified. Okay. Now I want to jump back to, to, to a topic that was, was opened up a moment ago, which is this concept of investment in policing. And Rosanna, Walter, John, you all, you all made reference to this. Is it your perspective that if we make an investment in improving policing, the quality of policing, that will have an impact on the number of homicides we're facing? I, I think it's one of the investments. And I think that continuing or increasing investments in places like the South Side and the South Shore, uh, like has been occurring, but needs to continue to occur, it also has to include investments in education and investments in intervention and prevention. So it's a number of investments. It, it is, it's not a, a cheap exercise. It takes commitment and investment really across the board. And if I can add, it also takes personal investment, like mm -hmm. people investing in the children. I participated, you know, this is Chicago Community Trust at the table or on the table week, and I was at a session on Tuesday where there were a lot of young people and the theme seemed to be they wanted respect and they weren't getting respect at school, meaning from adults, not from their peers. So they're going to get it wherever they can find it. So if we could start to invest in our children and tell them we're proud of them, I mean little things like kids come before me and unfortunately we watch them grow up. You know, our 13 year olds, we watch them grow up, we see that, you know, they keep, a lot of them keep coming back. And you know, just a little thing like I looked up one day and I said, oh my gosh, you, get, you got like four inches taller. And he just stood up a little straighter and beamed because we cannot forget they are human beings. That was another theme that kept coming up and I think that sometimes we get caught up in the crime. Um, Brian Stevenson has a, has a great quote in his book, Just Mercy, which says, you are always more than your worst crime. And I think we as judges, if we see all the bad stuff day to day, police officers who see much more than we see, I think that it's too easy to forget that because you see the victims, you see the crimes, you forget that they are as much a victim sometimes. 
This is a conversation that came up last night. Did I cut you off, Rosanna? No, go ahead. Conversation that came up last night in our, in our, in our uh, dinner table uh, talk um, about the allocation of resources. And apparently, you know, obviously money is a, is a huge uh, hurdle to all of these issues we're discussing. But apparently some other cities are better able to operate their police forces by having non licensed police officers doing certain jobs which doesn't happen here in Chicago, is that right? No, just, uh, so I think one of the um, comparisons, if you do look at the size of our police department, Chicago compared to other cities, we're one of the biggest per capita, so it's adjusted for our population. We're about the same uh, in terms of sworn officers, officers that have a badge and a gun, um, as New York City. Where we are actually very different, even than Los Angeles, that has actually a much smaller sworn uh, officer, small, smaller group of sworn officers, is in the civilians that work in the department. And so I think what that means in practice, and I know the city is really moving towards more civilianization, bringing civilians into the department, which I think is going to be important, is you end up having those sworn officers with their pension and their police training doing jobs that you could have a civilian do. And so we're not actually getting the you know, most bang for our buck in terms of our sworn officers because they're being pulled off the street into jobs that ha you know, have to be done to administer the police department. And so I think that is a place where the city is trying to move in the right direction. But you know, Chicago has something like 30 um, civilians per 100,000 population. New York City has 170 per 100,000. And I think Los Angeles has closer to 80 per 100,000 civilians um, per capita. So we're, we're just really under-investing in that area and then mi diminishing our capacity of the sworn officers by pulling them into those jobs. We've, um, we've been hearing a lot today about different theories and philosophies in terms of how we should handle our policing and handle our, our, our uh, criminal justice system. Um, and there's talk about an old methodology of very aggressive, you know, throw the book at them type of, of criminal justice being something that might have been the, the mindset 20, 30 years ago, but we're evolving past that, more into community policing and more working with creating the resources that are necessary to decrease crime in the first place. Um, that being said, um, Superintendent Johnson's no longer here today because he had to go to, a, to a, an official um, event, but um, he came to the CBA a couple of months ago and he was very clear in, in his belief that his words were, our criminal justice system is a joke. That's a quote. Um, and then he went on to explain how uh, members of the community really don't feel threatened by the fact that been, they've been arrested, even if it's on a gun charge, because they know they're about to get out. They'll be out in a matter of a few days, and they'll be right back on the street doing what they were doing uh, previously. He then compared New York and Los Angeles and talked about much stricter criminal justice uh, systems and stricter penalties, which in his view, discourage people from committing gun crimes. Um, Walter, can you tell us a little bit about the criminal justice system in California, which I believe has a, a three strike system in place? Right, and I believe Illinois ha also has uh, a system of prior offense uh, basically escalating upwards. Uh, so when I was practicing as a criminal defense lawyer in Los Angeles County, uh, I, my practice began just as a three strikes law took effect. And uh, my view, what the three strikes law did is that it scooped up a lot of middle-aged uh, men who may be in their 30s and their 40s, past their prime, uh, if they were involved in crime in the past, perhaps as a 20 or 23 year old, they had committed a couple of violent felonies, but now their third strike was a relatively minor offense. And for that, they were being sent off for 25 years to life at about $60,000 a year and destroying individual lives. Tell us how the three strikes rule law works. Well, so you're convicted of a felony and if, then you get a second conviction, what does that do? If you have a, two prior serious uh, or violent felonies in California, well, if you have one prior violent felony, your next felony sentence will double uh, and serve it at 80%. If you have two prior violent felonies, your third felony, regardless of what the felony conviction is, uh, the third strike law as passed was 25 years to life. Now, California lived with that for a number of years until it realized it just could not keep on doing it. It, it was essentially uh, enforcing on the wrong people. But there was another law which took effect a few years after that, 1020 life. 
and 1020 life was the gun enhancement for the commission of certain enumerated felonies, for example, robbery, if that was committed with a handgun, that would be a 10-year enhancement. If the firearm was discharged during the robbery, that's a 20-year enhancement, and if it struck somebody, that was life in prison with the possibility of parole, served at 85%. Uh, that, I know, had a significant impact because the district attorney's sentencing scheme in LA County was that a first time robbery was two years state prison. When 1020 life came into effect and there was a gun, the 10 years would be tacked on. So whereas a young adult, 20 years old, rather than two years at halftime, was doing 12 years at 85%. That word spread quickly and had a significant impact because it was relatively targeted. Now, there is a gun sentencing bill, which is pending in Springfield. Uh, the mayor does support that bill. Uh, Superintendent Johnson does support that bill. And it's meant to target people who actually use guns when they commit crimes. Uh, and uh, from my own personal experience, uh, without attaching a moral value to it, it undoubtedly had an impact. So your belief is, based on your personal experience, that stricter gun sentencing laws and enforcement of those laws will likely have an impact upon the number of gun offenses that we see here? Strictly targeted gun sentencing laws can have an impact. Okay, Rosanna. So I don't wanna, I haven't looked at the bill and, and the crime lab is not gonna take a position on bills per se, but I think what sort of what I would say sort of stepping back is, it, it, I don't think anybody in any part of the system, whatever, you know, whatever part of the system, and it's really not truly a system in the sense that it seems like lots of pieces of it are siloed and there's not good coordination and sharing of information, but I don't think anybody feels like what we're doing is really working, is making people's lives better, is helping to make the city and the county safer. So I, I think it behooves all of us to be willing to sort of step back and take a hard look at what we're doing and are there ways that we can improve outcomes. You know, it, it is not serving anyone's interest for someone to be locked up because they're poor and they have a substance abuse problem. Um, but it's also not serving anyone to have people who are really harming their communities and their neighborhoods uh, who are able to get out, uh, you know, when they're, you know, be able to pay their bond and get out really quickly. We have people sitting in the jail for things like retail theft and for substance abuse um, because they can't pay $500. Um, so, so I think we should be willing to step back and look at how do we ensure that the system is aligned and focused on things that are doing huge social harm and violence, and, and what are the range of options we should be exploring, um, you know, including better services and supports. When a 13-year-old is shot twice and caught on, with a gun twice, they're clearly raising their hand saying, I need something, and I don't think we're giving them that something. Mm -hmm. And if I can jump in, that's exactly the third part of my, when I say they're getting younger, crimes are getting more serious, and my hands are tied, because I, the trauma is so clear, I don't have trauma training and I can spot it. But yet, the options are becoming more and more limited. You know, there is, in the past, and in other counties, I understand DuPage County can still send kids to treatment. We can't, there's nowhere to send them for residential treatment, for mental health treatment. Even drug treatment, the, if they have insurance, uh, and if the insurance will cover it, they'll keep them for maybe a month now. It used to be three to six months or six to nine months. Now they're out, they're in and out. So, you know, what do we expect? I'm gonna, I'm gonna change my approach here a little bit here as we, as we, as we start to, to run out of time. Um, our, our topic here was basically what Chicago can learn from other right. cities in terms of, of addressing this, this crisis. Um, I understand that a lot of the comparisons that I try to draw might be faulty comparisons. Let me ask the four of you this question first. Um, is there something, John, I'll ask you first, mm -hmm. that Chicago can learn from another city based upon your experience and observations that we could learn from another city to implement that will help address this crisis? Sure, but before I do that, I think what we, sh what we really need is more grandmothers out in some of these neighborhoods to get control, because they had stopped this thing in about 30 days, but that's not the case. So there are plenty of programs going back, right? Reinventing history, 
uh, Project Exile comes to mind in Richmond, Virginia, other smaller areas. There um, um, was a program, um, gun involved violence uh, elimination, and providing funding, grant, grant money, DOJ grant money, um, that a lot of times were used for officer overtime, uh, federal task force for state and locals, which dumping the money in that specific pot, I don't know if that really has a major impact. When you bring the federal government into it, using Chicago as an example, which may be different, is you can't prosecute a 12 and 13 year old for federal gun crime. There's nowhere to put them. There's no mechanism to prosecute that case in federal court. So I think that, you know, as Rosanna said, there's, there's so many different pieces. I would say uh, th there's smaller towns that do have violent crime. Buffalo, New York uh, comes to mind where Inglewood, let's just pick on Inglewood, um, could be a Buffalo, New York. And what a program, I think you need to do a good study in one specific Chicago police district to see what the results of that those programs and the enforcement and social programs, does the Chicago Police Department even employ a, a children's psych, uh, child psychologist? I Probably not. Uh, to deal with some of these issues that the judge sees on a daily basis. Um, but it's not, you can't enforce your way out of it, but there's certainly uh, bills pending in Springfield that maybe, as Walter said, took, started to spread the word in LA uh, amongst the people who are out there committing crime that Wow, I think they're actually serious now. But, you know, I've talked to people who have murdered people, and the last thing they're thinking before they make that split-second decision to pull the trigger is if I do this, I might get a 15-year sentence for using a gun if I don't kill this person, right? Or they don't understand the fact that if they get charged with a, a felon in possession case in federal court, that they're not going to central or, or southern Illinois. They might end up in Oklahoma or North Carolina or southern Florida where their family may never have the opportunity to see them. That, I don't think that really goes through their mind as they're pulling the trigger back on that weapon, right? But I would just say if we could start in one, and, and it's to the detriment of other districts, if, especially if it's successful right out of the box, because then everyone's gonna clamor. Uh, I think Rosanna mentioned the alderman. Well, why is that alderman getting those resources? I'm not getting anything. Well, Chicago is just frankly too large and too segregated that what may work here may not work in that district. So I, I, it, the, the, the problem is so complex. But meanwhile, we're coming on June 1st and we're pretty much neck and neck of the numbers that we had in 2016. And there's a lot of talk about it. But I'm, I'm afraid we're, we could even surpass what we had last year. Walter, in your experience, is there something we can learn from another city to help our problem here? You know, I'm not sure about another city. But I think it's really important to understand how complex this is. And to paraphrase the title of a book, there is, you know, what is right of bang after the gun is fired and what the roles of the criminal justice system. And uh, look at, for example, why are clearance rates in this city relatively low? And ask the question whether the reason that there are low clearance rates is perhaps because uh, folks in the neighborhoods where these crimes are taking place and they just want to be safe, if one of the reasons there are low clearance rates is because those folks don't trust the police. And at the same time, there's the equation of the danger of retaliation is greater than my trust in the police. So the effort that the police have to do into building trust, because trust leads to legitimacy, and it's very clear that out of legitimacy comes greater cooperation with the police for people as witnesses. But left of bang, before the gun is even picked up, before the trigger is pulled, we need to treat these conditions like a public health problem. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've represented so many young people during my career. Uh, what actually probably led my transition out of being a public defender is having lunch one day, and at my office, of course, and I had three open murder cases at the time. This is back in LA. And I suddenly realized that all three of my murder clients were 19 years old, all three of them. And that means that the seven years earlier, there were 12 year old little boys. What changed? That is where we have to focus our attention. And those little fourth graders and fifth graders right now, what is the trauma that they are living with? 
How many kids in Inglewood and in Austin are living with trauma from the youngest of ages? And we need to find and embrace those children and strengthen them and build them up and give them other options than picking up a gun. And to stand up very briefly here, because the crime lab does have access to data from all over the country, so give us a quick answer about my question there about what we can learn from someone else. And then what I would like to do is wrap up before we ask for audience questions. And I would like to ask the four of you, what's the one thing you'd like to see happen, if we could have happen now, to make a difference in this crisis? But before we get to that, Rosanna, can you tell us about other cities? Uh, can I answer that question and also say that it's probably an example from another city, which okay. is, you know, right now, I think the whole is less than the sum of its parts. And I, I think we really need everyone who all claim to care deeply about this problem to figure out how to set their personal grudges and egos aside to get into a room together to come up with a shared vision and plan so that we can use all of the city, county, and state resources much more effectively than we currently are. Unfortunately, we have a dynamic where too many political leaders don't like the other political leaders, and so they're not, I think, coordinating in ways that are desperately, desperately needed. This problem is too big and too urgent. No single unit of government is going to be able to fix it. And so we need to find a way to get all of those elected officials to be in a room and come up with a shared plan and vision. And then we need that vision to be shared with the all the other partners that need to be a part of it, the philanthropic sector, the corporate sector, leaders in the community, because right now there are lots of things happening, but it's not making a dent. Okay. Walter, what's one thing you'd like to see happen? Uh, what I'd like to see happen is uh, no more panel symposiums, that rather than coming here, you make a commitment to volunteer, write checks, and become active and invest directly in helping these young people. Judge Mendoza. Uh, that's funny, I just said that on Tuesday. Um, <laughs> Sorry. I, <laughs> no, I, I feel exact, I, I mean, this is great. There's obviously very committed people. It's a Friday, it's past four o'clock and you're all here, obviously. Yeah, but it's raining. And people, you know, and people were at this, at the table event on Tuesday. But the frustration is, is, I met wonderful people then, I'm meeting wonderful people now, but we all need to garner our energy and direct it toward our young people so that they're not in this pipeline. That's why, yes, we need financial capital, so those that can write checks, please write checks. Those who can give of their time, give of your time. It's not that much. And my biggest frustration about the money piece is that there are these great programs out there and then, and I know, you know, they're sort of number driven, so then the numbers aren't there, and so the program gets cut. And this was another thing that, that was expressed at this uh, event on Tuesday by the young people, that they feel like they've been lied to. Because let's say you need 40 kids to show up to a program. Well, in general, we all know teenagers, a lot of them are gonna just, regular, uh, typical teenagers are just gonna slough off anyway. Well, now you've got teenagers with criminal backgrounds and trauma. You know you're gonna have even less of those to show up. But the ones that actually do show up and are looking forward to this program and have committed to this program, and suddenly we're like, we're gonna to try to get more funding. You know, and I have this from experience, because we have, have had, I don't know, Judge Tillman, where it's at, run for change. We were running with these kids, and there was, you know, a lot of kids stopped coming, but kids, there was a certain group that kept coming, and then suddenly we had to say, mm, we're not meeting next week, we're not meeting the week after that, we're gonna to try to get more funding. Those are my frustrations, because I feel like there are a lot of well-intentioned people writing checks, but they're not really understanding the demographic that we're working with. John? Um, if, we could, if I could, one thing I think that would make a huge difference is just the influence from the adults, right? Specifically from the male adults to these males who seem to be a vast majority of the offenders. A 13-year-old kid judge that was shot two times, recovered in the hospital bed, and within 48 hours was on the street again. Obviously, his mentors were the guys he's slinging dope for, the guys that he's getting these guns from, and the guys he's shooting on behalf of the older gang members. If there is no structure above this young man, then he's going to seek out because he need, he's crying out for help, as we all agree, 
So the only one who's going to answer that cry is the 19, 20, 21, 22-year-old who hands him money, gives him shoes, gives him clothes, and in addition to that, gives him guns and orders to do violent crime. So unless there's a structure of, and that's why I sort of made the joke about the grandmas, but if there is no adult structure in that home, in that household, then you can throw all the money at it you want in the world. It's not going to give them an opportunity to grow. So I just wish there was strong, solid, structured mentoring programs everywhere in this city for those who would, can take advantage of it. Okay, it's four o'clock on a Friday, and if this was a room full of teenagers, <laughs> They'd all be anybody texting. who answer, asked a question <laughs> would probably get an earful as soon as we left here, right? How could you ask a question at four o'clock on a Friday? But since we're not teenagers, does anyone have any questions? Okay. Thank you for staying till four o'clock on a Friday. Um, my question and the question I get often is, there is a lot of desire to assist in the communities. I, I'm an attorney who live on 19th and Lawndale and mentor and do those sorts of things. But a lot of my friends and colleagues simply don't know where to go to assist. So is there, uh, particularly for the gentleman who works uh, for the mayor, is there somewhere people can go to find out about programs and learn where they can best be of assistance here in the city? I don't have those uh, particular websites at my fingertips, but I know at the city of Chicago, they have a mentoring program page. Uh, and I don't want to endorse any. Hi, my name is Mary Long. I first want to take 30 seconds just to give you a little background. Just to let you know that on March 12, 2012, <laughs> I was riding home from school. We had just completed our cohort program for a bachelor's degree in social services. <clears throat> and we were celebrating in Bennigan's and having a great time. <clears throat> and I get the phone call that nobody in America wants to get. My only child was shot and killed. Eric Williams, my only child, was shot and killed March 12, 2012, while I was celebrating and completing my degree. I have been personally affected by gun violence. However, I did not let that stop me from continuing to do the right thing and what God wanted me to do. Since 2012, I have been volunteering one block from where he was murdered, 79th and Ingleside. Eric was not a perfect young man, but I've heard a lot of you talk about gang related, but this was not gang related. Eric was a union carpenter, he was a Christian, he was a mama's boy, he was a son, he was a nephew, he was a friend. He was a contributor to society. However, God said, I will use that pain and I will turn it into a good. And that good is the ministry of Sacred Ground Anti-Violence Organization. I volunteer with the restorative justice sessions, mentoring, tutoring for the last four, five years since he, he was murdered. However, for the first four years, it was part-time. But when I saw the devastation and the traumatized students that were coming to school with all kinds of issues that would only share with people like us in restorative justice sessions, where they felt safe and comfortable. And so they would share what would be going on in their homes, which was just sometimes horrific stories. So these kids are coming to school traumatized and abused and lost. So I've been volunteering there meant to in tune with several other things that we do. We prepare students for jobs and trades, all kind of constructions coming up, and our children don't have a clue on their math that they're doing. It's sad. So all I'm saying is to say one thing. We cannot solve 
a problem if we don't get right up close in their face in the problem. We must get close to the problem in order to solve the problem. We cannot solve this problem by far. So my question to you is, how do I keep going when I apply for a grant and they're telling me that your budget is not big enough? I applied for the mayor, deputy, deputy chief. I applied for that mentor initiative grant. After volunteering all of my services, the people that come in, I've managed to get Seven people from my church to come in and volunteer with these students, tutoring, mentoring, trips, all kinds of stuff. Now, the need is more, and I need funds, and they tell me, well, your budget's not big enough. It's not $50,000 or more. Don't even apply. We can't help you. And so it's like, here are all the people on the small people that's volunteer because I don't have a budget that's a big enough, our budget comes from the fundraisers we do and the dues that the organization pay. So because I don't have this budget, I'm not even eligible for the grant. And then kind of find out that there were 200 people, we all scrapping for this grant like, like ants over a piece of crumb that only nine schools was qualified for. <laughs> so I'm just saying that to say, where do we get the support when we're doing the work from the ground up? We're not asking the government and the White House and, 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 and the city to, we have already been doing the work in the school with our boots on, feet on the ground for five years. And I apply for a grant and they say, oh, well, you don't have $50,000 or more budget? No, well no, because I've been volunteering. Now I volunteer full time. I resign from my job because my heart is just totally, totally broken in pieces to see these kids that have absolutely nobody. Yeah, there's police in the school when the fight break out, they're sitting there, which I think it's, they could use their time a little bit more useful and engage and mentor some of them kids but they won't open up to the police, but they will police call us restorative justice, peace circle, and they open up and they are able to be able to be comfortable and relate. Now, restorative justice programs have been evidence-based. So who can I partner with? Where do I start from the ground up? Thank you. Thank you, Mary. M Mary, I, I think there are enough people in this room who would want to help and see how we can help. And I think because we have such good representation from so many different segments of government that you should not be unheard. Thank you, Mary. And you know what? That's one of those moments that I, I don't think we're going to, to, I don't think we should top that. I don't think we should try to, to, to continue on. And I think that's probably a good point for us to to end our panel discussion right now. Thank you very much, Mary. Thank you to all of our panel members. Um, and now I want to, uh, um, well, first of all, um, I should probably, um, before I step down here and hand off to Judge Mulroy to wrap things up, and I know Chief Judge Evans is here to say a few words. Uh, this whole thing, as you know, came together very rapidly and it would not have come together, uh, but for the, the, the help of our, of our amazing committee, uh, Terry Murphy, obviously, uh, Judge Mariam Ahmad, Jesse Ruiz, Josh Flagel, Packy Conlon, Gina Devoney, Stephanie Stein, of course, Lori Lightfoot, unbelievable help, uh, Tony Romanucci, Judge Mulroy, thank you all so much and thank everybody here for being part of our program. Um, I think it's appropriate now that I hand off to Judge Mulroy because when we reconvene in September, he will be president of this association, and he'll give you a little preview of what we plan to do then, and I think Judge Evans is also going to share some, some thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Your dedication is so evident by the fact that you're still here. Um, you, 
we're very, very proud that we have such a fabulous audience. It was a long day today, that's for sure, but it's not as long as a day a mother spends in one of these 17 neighborhoods waiting for 13 or 14 year old child to come home from school. Talk publicity and involvement is what we're doing today and what we're going to continue to do over the next year in the Chicago Bar Association. Uh, we're making this a, a target, a focus of next year. We're gonna have two more of these summits. Um, we wanna get our lawyers and our judges, our members involved in this serious problem. We wanna work with the community to see what they want us to do and get their input. Um, today was a beginning for us, a start to organizing our members. Uh, listening to what these incredible panelists had to say was a real education. They're smart, they're determined, they're focused. They had a lot to tell us. We're gonna continue this initiative, but we need your help. We need your input for the next two summits. One will, is scheduled for September, one for October. Anyone who wants to volunteer to give us advice or suggestions on what we should talk about would be um, greatly appreciated. You know, we're gonna win this battle because we're gonna openly and repeatedly talk about this problem. We're going to attract money and we're not gonna give up. We're not gonna give up until peace is restored in these neighborhoods. And we're gonna win this battle. We're gonna win this battle because of the dedicated men and women that you heard speak today. These people who are devoting their lives to solve this problem. We're gonna win this battle because we're gonna outlast, outfight, outthink, and overcome those who want to disrupt our peace. We want to win it because the neighborhood deserves to live in peace, like all the other neighborhoods in Chicago. Thank you so much for doing what you did today, staying here and listening to this, showing your involvement and your commitment. How can we not achieve our goal with people like you? To say good night and to Thank you uh, is Chief Judge Timothy Evans, who's also done extraordinary work in this, in, in this area. Chief. Thank you very much, uh, Judge Mulroy. I simply um, want to note that the hour is late. I recognize that. And I just wanted to thank all of the uh, elected officials, the appointed officials, the members of the judiciary that I see participating, the uh, officers uh, who are here, the community representatives who had marvelous ideas. Uh, and I, I want to acknowledge the work that's been done by the Chicago Bar Association. Uh, they deserve our thanks. Uh, Dan Coden um, is um, very near the end of his term and um, programs like this he committed to early on. And uh, a lot of us make commitments, some of us are able to keep them. I'd just like to conclude uh, this uh, afternoon's event by standing ovation for President Dan Coton. Thank you.